Today, I'm going to take on a dead trade to find out if old things were really more repairable and longer lasting. This is a radio from 1939. Radio was first popularized in the 1920s and was the first form of consumer electronics. It'll be interesting to look back at how technology began and how different it is from something modern. I first attempted to repair this radio in 2014, some nine years ago. And as you can see, this one over here, wax is coming out there. In that video, I did replace some capacitors and get it partially working, although the sound was distorted. I never revisited the project and the radio has remained unused since. When I last plugged it in, the dial lights lit up, but the radio didn't start playing any audio, not even static. I'll pull the chassis out of the cabinet so we can have a look at the construction of this radio. You may be surprised to see the lack of any circuit boards. Most components are just point to point soldered with their leads floating mid-air. Many components inside being rated at peak voltages between 500 and 600 volts. This is one piece of equipment you need to have a proper understanding of and the dangers of high voltage before even attempting to work on it. The high voltage is required for the vacuum tubes to function correctly. Because this radio predates the transistor, integrated circuits, and the semiconductor diode, it relies on vacuum tubes to operate. There are many different types that perform different tasks. In its most basic form, it acts as a diode, but one tube can have more than just one diode or even extra grids to extend its functionality further. Let's have a look at the tube lineup to get a better understanding of how this radio works. Bearing in mind, I don't know a lot about tube equipment myself, but I want to try and explain the fundamentals. We have a 25Z6G rectifier which converts AC to DC current. Next to that is the output audio amplifier, the 25L6G. On the left side of the set, we have a 6B6G, a first stage audio amplifier a 6U7G, an IF amplifier and detector, IF being a fixed frequency, usually around 455kHz, and a 6K8G, an RF amplifier and mixer tube. In the most basic explanation I can give, these tubes are amplifying and cleaning up various RF and IF signals. There is technically one more tube in this radio which isn't even on the chassis. It's known as a 302. Basically, a 1930s light bulb. I couldn't find many references to radios using this, so I'm not totally sure what its function is, other than it may have something to do with regulating the 6 and 25 volt heaters for the tubes. The major issues with any early piece of electrical gear, whether it be an early radio or television, is capacitors. The wax and paper capacitors typically turn into resistors, allowing DC current to leak through. Typically, the capacitors will only allow audio or RF to pass through. The other type to look out for are electrolytic capacitors. These are usually mounted to the top side in metal cans, but can be covered with cardboard. These tend to short out. There are also plenty of resistors worth checking along the way. The tubes are socketed to allow for easy replacement. However, it would turn out to be the capacitors that would be the more common point of failure in these radios. I purchased some replacement capacitors to get me started, however I ended up ordering a pack of common sized capacitors for these old radios as I ended up needing more than I expected. I'll start with the electrolytic filter capacitors. A replacement for the 16 microfarad metal can capacitor has already been fitted, but the original is still in circuit. At first, I thought I could get away with just replacing the 0.1 microfarad paper capacitor, but having learnt more about the failure points of capacitors, it's best if I remove the original metal can capacitor from the circuit. Because of the lack of printed circuit boards, the only way to mount something safely is using a tag strip. You'll notice two were originally used in this radio, so I think it's an appropriate addition. I can fit each component onto the tag strip and solder the leads from the other side. There is both a polarized electrolytic and an unpolarized film capacitor across this part of the circuit. From what I can gather, the film capacitor helps filter high frequency noise, which the larger capacitor does not. Having completely removed the original 1939 capacitor from circuit, the tag strip can be mounted nearby. 
the wires can then be soldered back into place. I'll repeat this process for the other filter capacitor. The original metal can has two 8 microfarad capacitors inside, so I'll replicate that. They share a common negative connector, however their positive ends will connect to separate wires coming out of the transformer. I'll even use reproduction cotton cable to bridge them together for greater authenticity. Capacitors like these store small amounts of energy that are typically used to smooth out voltages or reduce hum from the AC line, depending on their application. It's always important to use the same or greater rated voltage when choosing a replacement capacitor. Like the other, it had been replaced, but quite poorly as one has broken loose. Like the original capacitors in this radio, these are manufactured by Ducon Australia, which indicates that these are very old, probably from the 1960s or 70s. With them removed, I'll get the new ones installed. It surprised me to see that all original components in this radio were made in Australia. If you were to have a US made radio at the same period, you'd find it would have parts made in the US. The world was a vastly different place a hundred years ago than it is today. We may not have had all the advances in technology had all manufacturing remained locally. However, because of how cheap things have become, many people do not repair items as they would have in the past. The 1920s and 30s was the Depression era, and that was followed by World War II. Technology was expensive and many people didn't have a lot of money, so repair was favoured over replacement. Today, with the replacement cost of many electronics cheap, and the cost of labour to repair high, it's not surprising to see why we create so much waste. As I continue to replace the old capacitors, you can see that not all are easy to access. I later discovered the side panels of this chassis are removable, which would have made this process a lot easier. One thing you won't find on almost any new piece of electrical equipment is schematics. Schematics for all early radios can be found in old books of the time, and many have been digitised online. However, they're not always accurate. A modern piece of hardware usually has many microscopic surface mount components to keep the size down. Everything in this radio was hand assembled, so components are usually easy to find and replace. Here is another electrolytic that needs to be replaced. I couldn't find a 50 microfarad, so I opted for a 47 microfarad, which is close enough. You'll find replacements tend to be smaller in size due to advancements in technology. Just have a look at the difference between the original and replacement capacitor. I even went about replacing one of the capacitors I installed when I was about 12. I had melted some of the coating off while soldering it on. As I have plenty of replacements, I might as well change it to avoid any unnecessary issues. The process of replacement is identical for the remaining capacitors. Paper and electrolytic variants are all we're really concerned about replacing. Mica capacitors can usually be left alone. These can be used in the RF section of the radio and replacing those unnecessarily can cause dial tracking and drift issues. It was at this point I wish I had known the side panel unscrewed. The old capacitor had to be cut out, the replacement soldered to its remaining leg and then fed through behind the band switch before the other side could be soldered into place. Inspecting the tubes, I found one with damage. The grid cap has separated from the glass. A repair has been attempted, but has failed again. Knowing that vacuum tubes are well under vacuum, I thought this broken top may have allowed air to enter, so I'll replace the tube. A valve or tube tester would confirm if it's any good, but I don't have one. Having done more research, I believe the glass actually seals the wire exiting the tube. Assuming that that isn't broken, you can repair the tube. Having not known this at the time, I purchased a replacement for about $15. This 6K 8G certainly looks a lot nicer than the one it's replacing, and has been tested by the seller. It's used as a mixer, which in simple terms takes the frequency the radio is tuned to, and the frequency the radio is creating via the oscillator, and puts out the sum and difference of this signal. The new tube is marked with a D broad arrow D, which means it's Department of Defense. It would have come from some kind of military equipment. You never know, it could have even come out of a plane. While we're going, I'll give the chassis a clean before reinstalling the shield. 
This shield stops interference between different sections of the set. With that, we've replaced the paper and electrolytic capacitors, one tube, and given the chassis a bit of a clean. Looking at the casualty list, you can physically see how leaky some of these capacitors are. Some of the original capacitors were already replaced by myself many years ago. I think it's time we tested this radio to see if it has been restored back to a working state. I'll give the inside of the cabinet a clean before installing the chassis. There's even remains of some wax that has melted out one of the old paper capacitors. After fixing the chassis into place using four bolts, I can connect the power lead and speak it to the radio. I initially powered the set on using a Variac to slowly increase the voltage while running the radio through a homemade dim bulb tester, which is used to limit the maximum current the radio can draw and protect it against catastrophic damage if something were to go wrong. The light bulb was glowing brightly and staying lit, indicating a fault or too low of a wattage globe. I removed the inbuilt light globe to see what would happen. As expected, the radio ceases to draw any current at all. On the assumption this bulb was acting as its own dim bulb, I ditched the tester to rely only on the Variac. It lit up and even had some hum from the speaker, but there was still no audio. This is what I got when I tested it about a year ago. There was also a somewhat burning hot smell coming from the radio. Could it be just dust on top of the valves burning off now that they've gotten hot? I checked the other valves only to discover another physically broken one. What on earth was the previous tech using to service this radio? A crowbar? The tube rattles and has been taped together. Beneath the tape is a smashed Bakelite base that has been poorly repaired. So it was in with another replacement tube. Making sure to transfer across the little grounding tab that connects one pin on the tube to the shield. I also discovered a hidden paper capacitor I had missed. It's a different colour to the others we removed, but I'm sure it's just as leaky. This 0.02 microfarad capacitor will be replaced with a new one. Powering on this time, the radio springs into life. But it's sounding horrible. The audio is distorted so much that you can barely make out what the radio announcers are saying. And music? Well, that's even worse. Still, the radio has a slight burning smell. Looking back at my original footage, you can tell the radio was distorted. So it wasn't the leaky capacitors, nor the damaged tubes. So what's causing it? Back under the chassis, I began measuring the resistors to find one was open circuit. It appears to be part of a voltage divider. Given it's open, the tubes are getting the complete wrong voltage, which would explain the distortion and why the surrounding wires have obviously gotten very hot. The old resistor was once 180 kilo ohms, although the schematic calls for a 200K resistor, so that's what I'll be replacing it with. While I had the radio back out, I also fitted some new dial lights as one was significantly brighter than the other, due to being vastly different globes with different voltage and wattage ratings. Time for a test. Well that was short-lived. 
A quick flash and the radio's dead. The filament in both new globes failed. They couldn't handle the current. As they're in series with the tube filaments, a blown bulb will prevent the radio from working. These claim to be suitable for old radios, but clearly they're not. I'll need to find some higher rated bulbs at a later date, but for now the dial lights will have to remain uneven. But with the new resistor, this radio sounds spectacular. I'll fit a reproduction cotton cable with an original Bakelite plug and reattach the back panel to complete the radio. And we're done. So this is it, a repaired antique radio. Electrically, it's running fantastic with a loud, rich sound and no more distortion. Was it more repairable than modern day equipment? Technically speaking, yes, but there was not as much of a difference as I'd expected. An old radio is easy to open, usually has a basic valve layout diagram printed on the case for home servicing, with advanced schematics also acquirable. However, you still need to have an understanding of the device, how to safely work with high voltage and have specialized equipment, such as a Variac, dim bulb tester, isolation transformer, signal generator, multimeter, and valve tester. I got away without some of that equipment today, but those serious about fixing a lot of these would need to have the proper equipment. Because it's analog, there isn't any software, so nothing's telling you what you can and cannot replace. The unit is built well, it's not flimsy or easily breakable, and wasn't designed to fail within a short period of time, which a lot of cheap items are today. This radio used Bakelite for its knobs and dial surround. Bakelite usually doesn't become brittle like plastic does. But there's also been a real difference in society's view towards repair. Some have become acceptant of items that only last a short time, and have enough disposable income to just replace them frequently. The cost of labour is too high to make many repairs feasible. I really have enjoyed repairing this radio. It's a dead trade and a dying hobby. The last people still able to repair this equipment are in their 70s and 80s. It's getting harder to get them repaired, and in 10 years' time, it might almost be impossible. My family has a fleet of old valve radios, all in desperate need of repair. It's why I'm learning to repair them. So if you want to see more of this content, please let me know. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, consider subscribing and check out the electronics repair playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.